the the platter there is a piece of of monkey pod I got from uh, Mike Smith. He uh, some of you know Mike, and you know he would go all over the place collecting wood. Uh, and he uh, found lots of exotic woods down in Florida and brought back this piece of uh, this piece of monkey pod. Uh, the customer was particularly uh, picky, so she wanted to make sure that that was that, that the finish was waterproof. So it's a, a brush on polyurethane varnish. Uh, and then um, you might remember a couple of months ago, I had some of these uh, uh, these weed pots that I had made out of oak. And I really liked them because they, they were a, a, a clear palette. And I could color them however I wanted, texture them, put every water designs on it. And she said, do you have anything that, that actually has some figure in it? So uh, I said, well, yeah, uh, and went ahead and turned this. That's out of a maple burl. Uh, and then That's she it. said, can, can, you make, uh, can you make that match the monkey welcome. pod? Excuse me? Uh, she, she asked if I could make that match the monkey pod, uh, which is kind of a, a tall order, but sort of fun. Um, so that it, that involved uh, bleaching the uh, the maple and then oiling it and then bringing it back with different dyes and then finally uh, several coats of amber shellac. So uh, that's where we came out with that. Those are uh, those are exceptional pieces, Steve. But, well, uh... the one thing that I learned. Uh, for this this presentation was that uh, the the Photoshop uh, uh, functions on some of the the photograph readers that we have on our computers are really good. So if you don't have quite the right brilliance in the colors or whatever, it's it's pretty easy, at least in this venue, to uh, monkey with it a little bit and make it look a lot better. Uh, I didn't do that with this, but as I was, as I was posting it, as I was playing with the photographs, I realized, wow, you can really make this stuff work. Uh, yeah. Not giving away any secrets to, to some of you who are more sophisticated with, with Photoshop than I am, but uh, I was very pleased with, with how, how you could present your pieces. Uh, Steve, Steve I, I absolutely have to say here, um, you prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that yours truly knows what to put in the can, but I'm not any good at taking it out of the can and putting it on a part. You are. That is well, phenomenal work with dyes and finishes, buddy. Phenomenal. Well, uh, actually, I, I ended up going up to Mark Adams School up in Indianapolis a couple of summers. And taking their their finishing classes, there's a, a guy that's been teaching those those classes up in uh, some school, I think, in Minnesota for 40 years, and uh, he really knows his stuff. So I had to do my homework. the uh, The platter, uh, maybe you remember, maybe six months ago, there was an article about the Japanese. A, a wood turning in Japan and how there are only just a handful of guys that, that still do it. And what one of those guys does is uh, uh, make platters that look like those. Uh, and in, in the article, the, the, the visitor to his shop asked if, if he, would, he would consider having amateurs make any of those platters. And he said, absolutely not which of course was a challenge. Uh, so I decided I would try to try to make platters that look kind of like his. Yeah, hey Steve, on the, on the flat surface, do you have any tricks for us, like a board with sandpaper on it or, or how do you do that? Uh, no, no tricks, just what you would expect. Turn it as flat as you can. Uh, I use a random orbital sander with a, a, a firm disc on it so that uh, it flattens out. Uh, you actually have to be pretty careful because your your uh, your gouges will end up 
uh, compressing the wood so that by the time you put a, a good finish on it, you can see an awful lot more than than when you, you you thought you had it sanded flat. But I guess I went up, you know, yeah. three or four hundred grit, and then a lot of a lot of sanding with 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 a sanding block and you know careful work. That, that, that's very nice. The, the, the nice both books is very well done. Great, thank you. Steve, did you turn that green or, or dry wood? Uh, the both of them were dry. Uh, I mean the uh, the monkey pod was really dry. I guess I bought it from Mike maybe five years ago, eight years ago, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, the maple uh, Bob Royce and I cut that about twenty years ago, but it's in blocks that were eight by eight by sixteen inches so it really wasn't dry by the time we got to the middle of that there was some some moisture left all right thank you craig all right this is uh this is actually a small one this uh finished out with a background at 22 inches square uh this is the cutoff piece of the last month's walnut sculpture that i did just uh, playing around with some more, a little more detail in the concaves and some more intersections. And what, what are the dimensions of that? I, I've got uh, it's 22 inches square, okay. three inches thick. And that's that same texturing process on the, the copper? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I have, I have uh, four different wallpapers that I use for the backgrounds. That's nice. Thank you. All right. Excellent. You do that final cut after it's all turned, right? To turn turn those four quarters? No, the, that's done first. Uh, the reason I do that first is because the position, the position of the polyptics or the spacing is more critical than the turning. And I don't want to lose a critical part of one of the turnings. So if you look in the, uh, the upper center, you can see just on that upper left square, you can see just a little bit of that convex in the center of that circle. If that was offset just a little bit more to the right to where that edge disappears in the void, sometimes it doesn't look very good. And you don't want to throw off the balance of where the cuts are to save a piece of the turning. Right. So you shift everything around just a little bit. How big is that piece? Uh, the background is 22 inches square. So, and it's uh, four inches around, so eight inches off of that. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. All right. You hit F11. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at full screen, uh, but, but I'll do it. You just want to get rid of the heading? Yeah. Thank you. All righty. Um, uh, wait a minute. Oh. Wow. Wow, what happened? What has happened when I hit F11? It was fine, you hit something else afterwards. All right, now Bob. Gorgeous. All Bob. right, uh, this was just a, a piece of cherry that I had uh, from a tree I took down in my yard number of years ago and uh, I started to turn it and it ended up with a whole lot of warts that I didn't like and didn't know how I was going to fix them and from that uh, went into texture mode and then uh, actually I did a, a, a dye over that using India ink because it penetrates and it gives you really a deep dark uh, black and then put some uh, black acrylic over that and then the green is a uh, seafoam milk paint. 
that you wipe off after about it, it kind of depends. You do it with a damp rag and it can be anywhere from a minute to about three or four minutes after you've applied it. Uh, basically, you're trying to get some of the flat surfaces uh, so they reveal that black again and keep some of the color in the uh, indentations. Uh, and then it's just uh, finished out with, uh, I use that uh, Krylon matte finish, that uh, 1311 finish that uh, uh, Norm turned us on to, and uh, that was it. What are, what are the dimensions, Bob? Uh, it's about eight and three quarters high by three inches in diameter. Is the finial integral to the top, or is it a separate piece? No, I turned that separately and then uh, uh, put it into the top. I had to do that uh, for two reasons. One. Uh, I couldn't have done the texturing in the top of, of that little button uh, with the finial on there. And I never would have been able to, uh, to paint that without ruining the finial. <laughs> hey, uh, Bob, 1311, is that, that's an aerosol can? Yeah, that's that aerosol can. It's Krylon, I believe. Yeah, it's Krylon, they, they call it Krylon matte finish. And, and you put that straight over milk paint and it didn't wrinkle the crap out of it? No, yes, I did. Uh, I didn't do it the same day, obviously. I let the milk paint dry for probably a few days before I, I did it, because I this thing was all done in stages. But uh, yes, to answer your question, I did put it directly over the milk paint. What did you do, what did you do inside the piece? I just sealed the wood. I was I was thinking about uh, putting that India ink dye in there, but uh, I just didn't see any point in doing it. It was just uh, more work than it was worth. I thought. I've done others with with a, a black interior, which I like. I just didn't didn't happen to do it on this one. What what you texture it with? Uh, I use a couple of different. Uh, uh, bits. Uh, the larger indentations are just a uh, kind of a teardrop stump uh, cutter and you just kind of lay, lay it down on its side and just just uh, very slowly and uh, consistently let it move into the wood. Up on the top, the little button up there, uh, or actually on the top of the box, I used a smaller stump cutter of the same uh, uh, style, the same teardrop type uh, uh, design. And then the very top button is done with a, uh, uh, they're, they're a um, what they call a cup burr. And you just basically going in at a very slight angle and, and the burr catches and you can just kind of uh, drill it into there and it leaves a that circular effect. Very nice. Nicely done. Yeah. I like that <laughs> the finish on the you left on the inside, the natural like that, the contrast. I think it looks excellent. Thank you. That. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. That, that contrast is really nice, and I think uh, making that black inside would everything be too dark. But that really nice, yeah. really nice. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to have to figure out how to take more web work away from you, Bob, so you can do more work like this. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Good photography, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm learning. I got a little light box, and it's uh, it's helped a lot. There's a you know, lot you can hide. <laughs> yeah, I cropped them and put them back together. They were both so I liked, what, I liked what you did. Yeah, that that was look good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to, before we move on, um, just let everybody know we will be doing. We will have a, a raffle tonight at the end um, for a fifty dollar gift certificate for. Uh, would and but you need to be present to win so uh no cost raffle but you need to be here at the end to um uh to uh to win the prize so all right uh michael early you there i don't see him on steve yeah. uh, I'll Tell me if he wasn't on i could take credit for the these nice pieces. Uh -huh. Sure, Preston. Uh, I will uh, scroll through these if he joins later. Um, I can't see the um, participant list, so if you guys see him join later, if you'd let me know. 
uh, okay. really a couple of exceptional pieces here that, that he's done. A lot of air. <laughs> Somebody buy that guy some wood. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Stefan. Well, these, uh, I've called them the no purpose wood drops. Um, I just like the shape. They're about five to six inches tall and four to five inches at the largest. They are canoba wax finished. Um, some of them were turned wet and some dry. They haven't cracked except for one that's not included here. And yeah, there's no purpose to it. These are different woods. On the left is uh, maple, and then front is sycamore. And on the left, the third one is mango. Then the fourth one from the left is box elder. Then comes mulberry, and all the way right, on the right is black cherry. Um, now, what am I going to use them for? Once a year, we have junior hematology oncology physicians graduating. And last year I made trophies for them, uh, real trophies like chalices. This year I thought once I saw these, oh, these are nice. Uh, they can put them as, uh, I'll engrave them at the bottom with a name and the years of their training, three years of training, what wood it is. And then they can put it on the shelves in the offices in the future. And the people from last year have appreciated that a lot as a individualized memory, not a bought um, kind of whatever trophy people can buy at a trophy store. Anyway, that's the story behind these. That's my thinking. It's perfect because you can call them blood drops. <laughs> you can, but... Steve, even though I'm a hematologist, I like to keep wood turning and my work apart. Uh, wood burning, wood, no, I, it's, it's, yeah, you could. I don't. That would have to be blood wood, though, if they. So. Right. <laughs> so this is the mulberry one. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty. That's yep. just pretty. Nice tool work. Yeah. Stephen, what, one thing, I really love these. Please don't take this the wrong way, but I, I want to offer what I think is a little constructive criticism. Yeah, awesome. The first one and the second from the right have what I look for in this shape, which is a little bit of concavity going toward the top. Yeah. I think a little more of that makes them slightly more attractive than the straight. Just, yeah. just my personal thing. It, it, I mean, my eye is drawn right to that one from the right. Second yeah. from the right. Makes it more look uh, look more like a drop also or a droplet. Yeah. And it's I, tricky. I was gonna comment. I don't envy you for trying it. It's a tricky curve. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was gonna also suggest uh, making the smaller ones uh, and paint them blood red to go with them, like around <laughs> the bases. And the other thing, which is nothing to do with hematology, but you could flatten the bottom rather than making it rounded and just paint them dark brown and you got Hershey kisses. Yeah. <laughs> in a larger size it makes a really nice box and Norm I really appreciate your feedback uh, and it does not rub me the wrong way at all Good. and I noticed that too that the different shapes bring across a different message and a different feeling and I'm not quite sure yet I'm going to experiment more with it I had one that I don't show with a really tall it was much even more con concave and I didn't like it um, I think this one that you're showing or that we are showing now is a very nice, indeed has a light, nice concave slightness, but not too much of it. Um, so I'm experimenting with it. It's really hard to get a continuous curve from convex to concave. <laughs> a good skill to build though. <laughs> All right. Steph, this is also yeah. yours. And this is um, a tulip poplar piece and for the ones who are there any unc graduate here on the call um if if there are some oh okay there's somebody um, steve uh, does, does it does it count you're muted now <laughs> Jeff. 
<laughs> Got to keep your finger on the button. There you go. If does it count if I foot the bill for a kid to go to UNC? It does. So ask. I'm going to ask you, Jeff. Do you know what the uh, what the Davy Poplar is? No. Well, then it doesn't count what you just said. Absolutely. <laughs> who who knows the Davy Poplar? I remember the Davy Poplar from when I was there. I don't remember the details, so tell me. So the Davy Poplar is a, a tulip poplar tree on UNC campus close to the old well on campus, which is about 300 to 350 years old. So it was there when the university was founded. And it's named after the founder of the university, so-and-so Davy. Um, and the tree is old and is dying in many places. It's tilted, there's been put cement into the base to keep it upright. And 100 years ago, they took a little seedling and planted a second one next to it, the Ju Davy Poplar Jr. And then 20 years ago at the 300, I think, anniversary or 250 of the university, they uh, took another seedling and placed yet another one in case the original would die, which eventually will. And some people have gotten engaged underneath the tree and celebrated because it's just a very typical university tree. Anyway, the big branch had to be cut off by the arborists last year. And I've developed a, a wood turning relationship with the university arborist, which is quite nice. Um, so he let me have a piece that's about two feet long and maybe 12 inches uh, diameter. Um, and I turned this as a first piece out of it. Um, it's green, as you can see, but now it has turned brownish as tulip poplar, I think, often does. This is the bottom of it. You see the heartwood in the middle. And not only was it nice for me to just turn it as a, a hollow form, but I immediately got three people who saw this on Instagram interested in this because a UNC graduate and they wanted to buy it immediately. Um, and there is quite a bit of interest in the people who are really Tar Heels. So my plan with this is to eventually, once I have made a few more pieces out of the wood that I have, um, to try to put it up in the Carolina Inn in Chapel Hill, in the entrance hall, if they let me, and then silent auction it off to the highest bidders. And hopefully there will be some well-to-do UNC alumni, and the money that comes out of it will go to um, a needed uh, a student in need fund of the university, and that will hopefully drive people to even uh, bid even higher for this piece. So that's the story behind this one. So how big is it, Stefan? Excuse me? How big is it? Um, it's, I've written it down, I think it's about what, nine? inches across can you see that on what i submitted uh i can't because i'm at uh hold on let me see hold on i got it nine and a half <laughs> wide four and a half tall yeah and it has a absolutely walnut. gorgeous the, the shape the form the dimension the distribution of the opening the fall of the curve really nice yeah. oh, thank That's you and I'm, I'm a unc alumnus and if i was rich i would bid on it but um, I think that's an excellent idea. That's a beautiful piece. Well, thank you. That's nice. Uh, you know, poplar often is difficult. It, 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 it very subject to, to tear out in the uh, sapwood. So the fact that you got that very smooth finish on it, that's, uh, that's good tool work. Nicely done. It also has a very nice touch to it. It's just one at all finish, which I typically don't use. It still has a, a, a nice softness to it, uh, not an artificial sealer style kind of sensation, which is nice. Right. Nicely done. Thank you. All right, Norm. Oh yeah, so uh, this little hunk of maple, uh, excuse me, cherry burl that I had lying around for ages. It was super dry and hard. Turned it probably three or four years ago. It's a tiny little piece. And it, it's one of those uh, burls that as you start to turn it, you see all the stresses in the wood and it starts to crack and move on you. So I just basically roughed it out and left it sitting there for the last God knows how many years. 
And just this weekend, I had a few minutes and said, I think I'm going to try and finish this piece up. Uh, it's just really pretty. It's stabilized a bit. I filled the cracks with CA and I said, why not just use CA as a finish on it? Um, I just have to finish the foot, but it's it's a tiny little cup. And this is one of those, every once in a while, you just make a piece for yourself. And that's what this one is. This is on a mirror? Yeah. They're pretty tricky. Mirror's got a little pollen dust on it, but. That's funny. So, so the entire finish is CA? Yeah. I sealed it. I put seal, uh, some uh, seal. I kept not seal seal. Something else first, but I just kept coating thin thin CA on it. So it's mul multiple coats. Yeah, seven so far. <laughs> it's still got a foot on it. Yeah, I really like the uh, the figure that you can see on the left hand side. Oh, it's got figure all over the place. Yeah. It's crazy. Is it the sheen of the CA or does that have a lot of chatoyance? It's got chatoyance of its own, but the, the CA helps highlight that. Very nice. Uh, more pepper mills. I didn't mean to bore you guys, but these things sold at the last market I was at, so I figured I should make some more. Uh, the only reason I'm showing it here is I'm trying something different. Instead of doing one with a line or something to differentiate salt and pepper, I'm actually playing with the shapes, mirroring the concave and the convex. Way trickier than I realized. <laughs> Even when I have the old piece here, I'm like putting it on the lathe and checking, checking, taking a little off, taking a little off. It is a pain in the butt to get them to line up so that the light disappears. I was not successful every time. Uh, especially after you blew the piece in, you realize that ah, uh, it doesn't quite sit the way I thought it would. Uh, but it's an interesting effect. Thought I'd give it a try. Oh, and uh, the two on the right, I've got some mahogany that you guys had pulled from somebody a while back. It was just so plain. I wanted to do something with it, so I'm trying some alcohol dyes. You try using a template to uh, to do that. If you make a template with one curve, it's no, it's all by eye. But again, after I do the first piece, I just keep lining up. This, I stop, I line up the second to try and get the, the light to disappear. Is pepper concave or convex? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I understand. <laughs> yeah, that's the challenge is remembering which one is which. Yeah. No, and I can attest that these are good sellers. People pick them up, but they they walk away with them. So that's nice. I, and Norm, I like I like the 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 ones that are, you're just playing with the the wood versus the spectra spectra ply. I think that's good. I, I think it it you know it 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 actually highlights the spectra ply ones, but I think they'll also sell because I think there's some people I've seen that with the bottle openers that there's some people that just want wood. Oh, I've got a couple of Paduk ones that were the only ones that didn't move. <laughs> okay. And it's, you know, Paduk's a lovely color, so you kind of wonder, but we'll see. May I ask what uh, price range uh, they go in is roughly? I'm sorry, what? May I ask what price range they go in roughly? Um, I used to way undersell them, and I had a vendor selling them for me that convinced me that they go, and they do go for 40 a piece, $70 for a set. So I super discount when you buy two. I tried a few of those and they look real pretty, but you know, when you got them in the kitchen and you start trying to plunge, they are a little tough to use with one thumb. Maybe it's because I'm old and I got arthritis in the thumb, but they don't work all that well. Well, I, I display them with one with pepper in it so people can sample it and hadn't had any issues. Your thumb dead, yeah. Yeah, it must be me. You need to do some exercises. You know, I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> All right, Preston. Hey, guys. Uh, this is one I did a while ago. Uh, I haven't finished anything in a while, so I'm going back into archives here. I don't know whether it was when we had Jimmy here or whether I saw him at the uh, North Carolina Symposium or what it was, but but I tried to pick a wood that had um, a wide grain in it and 
I burned it when it was still chucked up on the lathe. I think I took it off the lathe and just kept the chuck on it. But um, then I used a wire brush like uh, uh, Lars was showing last week. And I thought that the wide part of the grain would burn away, but the skinny part did for whatever reason. Uh, maybe that's the winter growth. I don't know. But uh, it's got some nice tactile feel to it. And then while it was still warm, I put some four pack, four wax on it, four paste wax. And it just soaked it up. And I had to put a couple of different uh, globs of that on it. And it really feels really good to the touch. I've kept this one. It's nice. Just saved it for next month when we do our burning uh, submission. Yeah. That's a, yeah, Preston, the only thing I, I would do different on that is that on the base is, you know, I would try to make it so I would burn that all the way past and then just cut back so you have a hard edge. There, it looks like it's a little faded there, right right where it makes the turn. You have it a nice hard edge at the top, but not so much at the bottom. And I, 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 that's just me. I just find that yeah. more yeah. appealing. I agree. Thanks for the feedback there. And um, also, the pictures are not very crisp either as I was looking at them. Yep. But um, it's fun to do. Like, like Lars was saying, you know, he burns a lot of pieces and um, I can understand why. Okay. All right. Now, this is one that I probably should have done, should have shown after we had the burl guy in. But this was a nice burl and uh, I uh, ducked it up in centers and then um, get a foot on it and then I started working on the inside and either I didn't uh, estimate correctly where the center would be but you can see in the bottom left picture where there's sort of a flat spot there also in the top picture and so I got close to getting too thin there and this was before I was doing um, I don't know why I didn't think of it then but but I could have gone ahead and cut through that and then uh, used epoxy to fill that in. But I stopped turning when I was looking at the bottom of it, the inside of it. And it was just so pretty with the bark inclusions and the, uh, and the swirling grain there. I wouldn't do a thing. I think you did it right. My only question is, is your lathe off center or something? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I but, thought you were going to tell us that you just carved that without any turning. Oh, no, that's just the wood. I just guessed the wrong center, right? Well, that's the right wrong center. Yeah. yeah. And then in the bottom right picture, you can see it's got sort of a, a nub there or a little horn. So I didn't do anything to the outside except just some light sanding and uh, with some finish. And I'm not sure what the, what the stripes are there, whether that's uh, bark dust or what that got in there. But um, I like it. I like this piece just because it's so unique, I guess. Rustic. It's a, it's a Flintstone bowl. It has, has that, um, the, the, the look of a, um, the old dough bowls that they would uh, hand hewn almost. It, uh, it, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very appealing piece. Very beautiful. Is it heavy? It is. It's a real, uh, a real chunky piece, yeah. Can't imagine, no matter what cylinder you use, that you can turn something with bumps on the outside of it. <laughs> <laughs> right. You got to be real fast. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, thanks, guys. Well, Steve, Michael Early has joined. All right. Uh, oh, my apologies. Hey. I was telling him that I tried to take credit for his pieces. <laughs> You're welcome to. All right. Well, let me go back to Michael's pictures here. Remember, we left off at Preston. All right. There several of us that tried to take credit for those pieces. 
Uh, well, that makes me feel good. I apologize for being late. It was one of those work things. Uh, that just tends to get in the way sometimes, doesn't it? And with a last name like Early, anytime you're late for anything, it's just humiliating. <laughs> All right. Well, make up for it. Tell us about these pieces. Sure. All right. I'll do it real quick. Um, so this is Black Cherry Burl out of a gentleman from South Carolina had given it to me. It was really wormy. Um, matter of fact, I'll, while I was turning, I think I pulled out three or four worms and then discovered that there was a family of, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, termites living in it that flew around once I stopped it from spinning. So it was pretty nasty. I wasn't sure what I was going to be able to get out of it, but uh, really pleased with the way it came out. Yeah, that's... So we should not tell PETA about this at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, PETA would not be happy. I just, I rehomed them to my dust collector. Let's put it that way. They're living happily there. Mike, what finish did you use? I just used a little bit of Danish oil uh, after a couple of coats and then I buffed it. And as you can tell, because of all those voids, when I say buffed, I mean super delicately touched it with the triple E buffing wheel. Yeah. Yeah. Just to burnish out that shine. Do you recall you know, at what have, uh, speed you Do you recall sorry, at what that? speed you eventually turned it, the inside? Uh, I would say initially I was probably in the 500, and then I would say I wouldn't, I didn't get above six, 650, I would imagine. Hmm. I think the scariest part was the radius scraper. Um, to just clean up the inside because of all those voids. I didn't want to see all the tool marks inside. So I did use Trent Bosch's uh, radius scraper to clean up the inside. And that was probably the most nerve wracking part. Uh, I call it pucker factor. It probably had a pucker factor of 10. Well, that's a, that, there's a, there's a lot of air in there. There so, is, but I, I, I'm really, I'm thrilled with the way it came out. I really wasn't sure, especially because of how nasty it was and the worms and the termites, but it's it's probably one of the my most favorite recent pieces I've done. Mm -hmm. And a nice job on the photography too with the four views. Um, I, I, that that really, uh, it, like like you said in your uh, email, it's uh, it'd be hard to find a uh, the right the right view to look at it. So uh, no, I think that's a nice job with the uh, with the four photographs like that. Well, really I was hoping I wasn't it. cheating because I know it's two photographs, but I thought, well, if I throw four into one, does that count as one or four? That's, You're good. You're good. I think good. that uh, the different views, it looks completely different. Yeah. yeah. Mike, do you know what you're going to do with it? I put it up for sale at a stupid outrageous price just because I don't really want to sell it. And if somebody's willing to give that to me, I'll be happy with it. But I, I, I envision it'll, it'll remain. Yeah, I envision it'll remain uh, where it's at in my living room. And what is your stupid, outrageous price, if I may ask? I think I put it up for like 1200 bucks. So I've done that once with a Redwood Bowl. It was the one that I didn't want to sell. And I put it out for $1,200. And everything else was way be below that at 400 and below. Uh -huh. and the person who had asked me, what do you sell? I sent him a PDF with my things. And he immediately said, why is this $1,200? And then we talked about it and what it meant to me. And he bought it. <laughs> I, you know what? That's the way I, and I really, I don't mean to get verbose and I apologize for being late. I look at it this way. Would I rather hold that in my hand and just be kind of proud of myself or would I be happier with X number of dollars in my hand? Yep. And 1200 would make me okay. I'll go yep. find some more burl somewhere else. That's the thought process I had. Yeah. In this view, it looks like it's a pretty substantial wall thickness. About how this, thick is it? That's a different piece. That's yeah, a this different is a, piece. The second piece, this one is about three eighths. But the reason why it looks much thicker from that angle is because of the way that that, that void angles inwards so there's a lot more surface area because it's angling inwards versus a dead-on you know what I mean so this one was um this was Bing cherry that I got from a buddy out in Oregon uh, so they just had to be two cherry pieces but this one um this came from Oregon 
it was it had a couple mm, checks in it and some some cracks so i cut the ends off and then just try to do the best i could with it steve go to the other view that's that one's about three eighths i think my yeah. favorite view is that bottom right one where you can see from the top through the back opening well now that's a that's a uh that's a big hole. <laughs> you guys know, um, uh, what do you call it? Nightmare Before Christmas? Yeah. That's that's what it reminds me. It reminds me of something that uh, that they would have a Nightmare Before Christmas, like a character. Right. Well, if you ever get that 1200 bucks, please go out and buy yourself some solid wood. <laughs> <laughs> you know, please, please don't. Like, please don't buy like a for that. Steve, I know you do a lot with resin, so do I. And it's always a struggle. Do I throw resin in it or do I put, do I leave it without? And sometimes I think it really hits home when it doesn't. And then sometimes I think, well, I missed the mark. They're really great if they had some resin in it. No, I, I, this doesn't need any resin. I mean, that, that wood stands for itself. If, if you go out and buy solid wood, buy some permites too. <laughs> <laughs> no hole, you only get 400 bucks. It's just yeah. too exciting to turn that, that much open air for me. I, 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 life's too short for that much excitement. You know, it's really, I don't, I'm not diminishing anybody else's work or my work for that matter, but I don't, I think it looks intimidating, but it's actually, you know, if it's secure and I, by the way, on both of these pieces, no, on, I didn't, I did a, a tenon on both. I didn't do a glue on a waste block tenon. These were both directly tenon to the piece and it was, so it was pretty secure. Yeah. And by the way, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you guys, A, backing up, and B, uh, the compliments and the, the kind words. It really means a lot. No, those are both both exceptional pieces, Michael. Thank you. All right. Let's, uh, let's see I where... think Merle's up next. Nope. Merle is, uh, Merle's at the end. Oh. Uh, Ron. Hi. Uh, good after, I guess, good evening, guys. Um, these are... Um, Three little uh, walnut and curly maple uh, tape boxes I made for um, three guys that I was a Cub Scout leader who earned their Eagle Scouts this past weekend. So uh, um, all of them are they're made out of eight quarter you know, kiln dry walnut, walnut and uh, curly maple was flat stock as well. Um, just embedded the Eagle Scout uh, logo coins in the top and bottom. Played around with a little bit of different shapes, or they all look similar, but they have diff slightly different profiles. The That's thing nice. that, yeah, thanks. The thing I liked, uh, I guess, more about it was the uh, first time I you know, did any of the curly maple. There, there really is a lot of coins, and it. it's hard to see in these pictures. But I was really surprised by that. No, that's not, I'm sure they'll be cherished. Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, they're, they're teenage boys. They get a lot of great feedback from them, but the parents were, I think, more, more uh, you know, uh, knew what one of the dads was a woodworker, if you know what went into it. And that's saying, uh, he's getting ready, he's a physician, and getting ready to retire soon, and asked me uh, if he can come and learn how to uh, use a lathe. And I said, well, I'm still learning. It's been less than a year happy to show what I know. Yeah. It's real, real interesting treatment on the lid fit. Yeah, it, um, you know, Bob, initially I was going to just do the bowl, bowls themselves. And so I, I had done um, you know, the little lip on the outside and then I'd done an edge on the inside and I wasn't sure I was going to do the lid. And then, you know, I, I probably a week or two went by so that I really need a lid. So that's, that's how I ended up with that. Um, I guess configuration for it. Must have done. And uh, just a, a quick story. I I I have for years. Our our church does a crossing ceremony for high school seniors, and they give them. They have a ceremony for the graduating seniors, and they give them a gift. And for years, I have turned these little wooden chalices to give to the high school seniors, and they have a candle in them, and um, and it. it I'm not sure how much they're cherished at that point, but 
I've, I've run into some of these kids years later after they've graduated college, some of them into adulthood now, and many of them will come back and, and thank me at that point and say they, you know, they still have that and how much they cherish it more now, more now than they did in the past. So I'm sure these will be those, that same thing where, um, it'll hold a special a special place for these kids who received it thanks i i hope so they uh they're really good kids i had them in cub scouts starting out as tigers at six years old and they're now yeah. all juniors and seniors in high school uh, this is um i am told it's pecan i think this is a street wood that i picked up off somebody uh cut down a tree um like the second or third time ever trying anything with a real natural edge for me. Um, it uh, is about seven, seven and a half inches in diameter, about four and a half inches tall. Um, what, oh, it's pecan. Pardon? It's pecan. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm still learning, but that's what they said it was. And it was done wet. Um, I dried, I actually, really actually had it on the lathe about three times. And I think that has, um, why I'm showing it, I'm looking for a little bit of advice. If you look in this picture here, the low edges um, are probably about a quarter to you know, almost three eighths of an inch thick. And then the upper wings are thicker. I don't know if it's in my process of you know, remounting it and turning it, that I got things out of center or something, but it, it's got this, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out why that is. I'm looking for any advice anybody knows. Look, looking at it, Ron, wood shrinks across the grain. So the low ends, the wood was a little bit skinnier there when you put it back on the lathe. And by the time you got it close to round, you wind up thin. And I have run into that. And the only thought is leave it real thick. Yeah. The first time around, at least an inch per foot of diameter. And you have to play with the different woods because walnut, you need a lot more than that. I've not done enough pecan, but you got to leave it real damn thick to come out uniform after it finishes shrinking up. Hey, well, I appreciate that. You're going to use, the, you use your fingers or a caliper. The, the visuals, because of the curve, will throw you off. It looks the same. You can't trust your eye when you're doing a natural edge because of that. You just have to constantly check because what's happening is it's getting thicker as you're going deeper. Very subtly, but it augments it because of the curvature falling away. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Conversely, conversely, it's really easy to get too thin right at the bottom curve. <laughs> and many a piece has been cut right through at that point. I, I, I got it stopped in time then. The, the other thing I was, um, you know, about this wood, it was cut this winter and that bark, you know, it is really on there. I was surprised oh, yeah. at how, how it's not coming off anywhere. Um, so that, that was kind of neat seeing that. All See right, the thank transition you very much. from wood to bark? See that lighter brown between the bark and the wood? When you yep. have that and pecan has it, 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 it's basically like a flex area. So the bark is more likely to stay on. Woods that don't have, is that the camp, cadmium, cambium layer? I always forget. Cambium is the correct term. When the thicker that is, the easier it is to maintain the bark. Great. Well, I've got a boatload of this stuff, so we'll be <laughs> trying different things. It, it's like turning iron when it's dry, though. So, you uh, can't, uh, <laughs> so um, what, what, just, a, just a critique on the shape here. I, it comes down to a pretty sharp corner at the base. And I think even from a standpoint of drying and not cracking, um, if you round that, and, and it's, a, it's a hard to, to know in a picture, but, but if you were to round that a little bit more, I think it would, um, so it just kind of, instead of stopping abruptly at the table, it kind of flowed yeah. into the base, I think. Um, but the amount of time you've been turning to, for you to get, you know, even a piece. This, I mean, this is this is a nice piece. Well, that's yeah. great advice, and I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, I'm no expert, but one other thing: when you're starting cutting from the outside, 
I mean, from the top going down, you can stop before you get to the low part. And then, then you could fine tune the, the thicker part there. You have to kind of, so what is, yeah, when you turn on the outside of the bowl to avoid that flattening shape, is you basically have to visualize where the curve is going to end. Even though you're not going to cut all the way to that yet, you just got to with your eye draw a line and say, I want to leave enough wood so that curve continues through the bottom of the piece. Got it. Yep. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks. Bob. Are there, Bob? I had to unmute. Okay. Um, this, these, both of these pieces are from a maple, a much bigger maple that had been down for several years. And these are cross cuts. And I thought the contrast between the, the wormy heartwood and the sapwood was just awfully dramatic. But dealing with all the wormholes is, is a real challenge. And on this piece, I used a bunch of Crayola glitter glue on the outside and just left the holes on the inside. And as you can see in the upper left edge, I got a little crack going there. Uh, I was just taken with trying to see if I could do something with the wood and also get something out of the dramatic effect between the, the heartwood and the sapwood. And both of these pieces demonstrate that. Yeah, it really is dramatic. So did that glitter glue dry hard? Yes, it dries hard and you can sand it. It, it, it takes, you know, it, it shrinks as it dries. So you have to use two or three coats, but then you can sand it smooth. That's uh, I've never, that's a new one. I've never seen anyone do that. I've never even heard of it using that as a, as a filler. So very interesting. So when you say cross cut, is it? It's just literally, this log was probably 22 inches in diameter. If, if you look at the edge of the, the heartwood, you get some sense of how big the tree probably was. Right. That's, that's the outside edge of the heartwood. And the sapwood was probably another two or three inches beyond that. Right. It, it, was, it was a really big tree. And it's just literally a cross section of the trunk. Right. And this is cut from a, a side of the heartwood. The, the center of the tree was somewhere off to the right. Yeah. Interesting. When you say Crayola glitter glue, is that glitter mixed with epoxy or mixed with varnish? Darn if I know, it comes already pre-mixed in a bunch of colors and in squeezable tubes. It's glue. I'm sure it's, it's not it's, epoxy it's, if it's Crayola, it's non-toxic, so. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I think it's this uh, version of the PVA glue or something like that, right. you know, yep. standard school glue. Okay. Right. Kids have eaten You're a right. It's a, it's, a, it's a school product for sure. Yeah. Okay. And I think on this piece, you, you really get to see the dramatic effect of the heartwood and the and the bug holes versus the sapwood. Uh, what'd you finish it with? Uh, sanding sealer and many coats of gloss lacquer. Start with. Very interesting, but that, that is a dramatic, it's very, it, the, the grain is very dramatic on that. Yeah, it, it's almost like two different woods. Yeah. <laughs> or rust stain. <laughs> well, it's like the side that was sitting down on the ground, you know, just got, uh, got the bugs in it and, uh, and started growing. It's almost like super ambrosia. Yeah, except that that except that that was the center of the tree. Yep, I know. That's 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 weird. So, all right. Well, very interesting. <laughs>
All right, Rita, you there? Oh, she's not here. She's working tonight. She was here, but uh, she's on the cell phone. It's amazing we're going to hold these off. But she wanted to show these tonight because of what Lars did. Uh, this is her version of blackening and burning and that sort of thing. You got the next picture. Yeah, she can. She can. We could resubmit these next month if she's going to be around. It. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, because that's uh, we're gonna we're gonna kind of talk, try to group together some of these uh, burnt pieces for for next meeting if she's well, interested. Yeah, I was laughing because she picked these out special just to show what but, Lars did, and, and uh, anyway, this is this one over here on the uh, lower left is carved, and then uh, I think it's black gesso. Um, the other one is uh, Osage orange. This one looks like a red cedar that's actually Osage orange. And uh, it had a couple of little splits and things in it. So she touched it up and the other one's red oak. The other side's textured, but she's pretty good at this stuff. Um, we tried burning like uh, Lars did and, and uh, disintegrated a couple of pieces. <laughs> We're getting better. Um, well, we look forward to seeing them, Jim, next month. Okay. <laughs> Jim, yeah. what did she carve with? What? What is she, on the top left one? Um, what did she carve with? That's burned with a. Uh, we made these little spring kind of things, uh, and and she burned little uh, dozens of little whatever's in there. And that, on the underside of the bowl as well. No, the underside is just plain. She just did the top rim. Oh, on, on the other side of the uh, Osage Orange one, she did that. Yeah, she did that on there. Gotcha. The other one is carved and then uh, blackened with, I think it's black gesso. That's nice. Mm. I wasn't going to submit this, but I thought I, I just did a video on this. In fact, it, when this is all over, I'll try to play it. But, uh, like I said, I need mouse lessons to do this. Um, we started. I started this in high school. In fact, in the upper right, you'll see a little plastic model. And I came home from school with that one day and got it about half together. And my dad said, uh, if you get that together and you want to try it, we'll scale this and uh, make a five foot model. So this is all done with hand tools. We didn't even have a drill press. This is done with a draw knife and hand saws and everything else. It's five feet long, has a two cylinder steam engine and a boiler, it's radio controlled. All the lights are 12 volt lights. This is before LEDs. Um, it's lots of fun. Uh, like I said, after this is all over, I'm not great at showing videos. I don't know that I can do it or not. But when you get all done, I'll try to show a video if you want it. Uh, I okay. got a video of the of the hull and what's in it, and then a video of the engine. Also, the engine was castings bought from uh, Stuart engines or Stuart steam engines from England, and you get a little lump of casting, and that's a cylinder. You have to drill it and shape it, and we drilled it with a hand drill and reamed it out with emery cloth. Uh, the milling machine was a piece of plate glass with emery cloth on it and you, you rubbed it back and forth till one arm was ready to fall off and then use the other arm and pretty soon you push it with your nose or whatever but anyways it, 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 it did work there's a two cylinder the crankshaft set at 90 degrees so it'll start but it's fun to watch steam engine I get burned every time I look at this thing but it runs on sterno and uh, a lot of fun, a lot of engineering in making a boiler to fit the engine. Um, you get a hundred pounds pressure in the boiler and you turn the engine on and it goes psh, and it, it runs for seconds and you're out of steam. You're not getting enough heat to the water. So there was a lot of engineering. When the, an old uh, lake boat captain saw this, he said, uh, you're doing a nice job on the engine. He said, did you start the boiler yet? And I said, no, I'm in sheet metal. I, I'll roll up a, some eighth inch plate and weld some ends on it and make a 
quart of water and put some, you know, I thought charcoal or something under it. And, and it worked, but you could only run it for like, oh, I don't know. I got it up to about a minute after I did 15 different things to it. But finally I made a sterno. It runs on sterno on a T-shaped uh, tray and uh, it'll run for about 45 minutes. Wow. Lots of fun. That's what you did before television and uh, when you didn't have any, anything else to do. <laughs> you shaped that with a draw knife on the kitchen table sometimes. Did they call you from the Suez Canal recently? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was unreal, wasn't it? Um, you know that. Yeah. yeah, that was a... That was quite a mess, but no, I, I've been in the water twice swimming after this thing because it got caught in lily pads once. And uh, the other time somebody had a fishing net out there. So I had to tear my clothes off and go swim out there and get it. Uh, but you Very nice, it. Jim. Okay. Continue, you continue to amaze. Well, after, after this whole thing, I, I could show a video. But... All right. Yeah, let's see where we end up time-wise. Or we'll just leave it on for anybody who wants to see it, if we can make it run. All right, Ted. Hey, um, so I just wanted to show this as a spalted. Uh, it's actually sweet gum, uh, spalted bowl, which I, I have a lot of. Um, I'm actually working with a bunch of other uh, sweet gum right now. But I just want to show this one. I really like the way it came out. You can look, if you look down on the front of it there towards the left hand, oh, I don't know, halfway, better than halfway down, you see where it's kind of pinkish red there. And it, you can see it there, but it's, it's, it's littered around the bowl inside and out. And that's actually from the spalting. So it's a natural spalting dye that uh, gets released in there. So it's pretty, pretty cool uh, stuff. So I just wanted to show mm. that. Um, you can see it on That's the gorgeous. kind of the right hand side here on this this piece as well. It just had a tremendous amount of spalting in it. I thought for the piece, it does have a a weak point in it uh, where it got um, a little too soft. But um, I decided to leave that in because I, I liked the way the shape came out on it and um, and the, the thickness and so forth on it. So I just uh, I just flooded it with um, shellac and stiffened it up. And then I did a final cut on it. And uh, this has a tongue oil poly finish on it and then polished with uh, just a buffing wheel. Uh, steel wooled out and then polished with a buffing wheel. And that's actually a wormhole in the bottom, that little circle you see down there. <laughs> it's, it's just really, and you know, sometimes coincidence, but the way that the spalting joins together in the bottom is just really just is spectacular in this piece. It just, it, it, you couldn't have planned it any better. Yeah, it looks, it looks fantastic. Of course, it looks a lot better than the photos show it as well, but uh, it's a really nice piece. I like the beveled top edge. Thank you. Yeah, you can see some of that dye in the top edge right there on the, fr on the front edge of it too. Like I said, you can see more of this when you look at it real, real life, which um, you don't always get, you know, with the sweet gum, at least you don't, you, you, a lot of times you get some good spalting, but you don't get the colors uh, as much. This piece had good coloring to it. That's very nice. I'm having a hard time seeing it, Ted. I think you should send it to me so I can actually see it in person. Okay, Michael. <laughs> uh, um, this was, uh, I did an Easter project, so it was the day before Easter, I went out in the shop and thought, oh, you know, Easter's coming, and I don't know, where some conversations, you know, about Easter, Easter rabbits, you know, and, and laying eggs and uh, joking around, so I went out and I made a, a couple dozen um, Easter eggs, and then um, I colored some of them. Actually, the only one that you can see in this photo colored is the one in the middle. The other ones are actually uh, red cedar, those purplish looking ones. And the rest of them just have oil or no finish. The one in the foreground there is just a really heavily rotted piece of wood, you might say, spalted and wormholes in it. And the one in the very back you can see is that way as well on that. 
if you go to the other photo of the eggs, yeah. So this one are um, the two on the left are both oak, and I dyed those one orange and one green, and you can really see the medullary rays in it, which makes it pretty cool. You know, both of those really come out cool, like you would expect to see, you know, painted eggs, you know, with lines and stuff in it. So I uh, didn't have to do anything too fancy with those uh, pieces to get them that way. And the one in the, in the foreground to the right is dyed um, orange on one side, I think, and yellow on the other, if I remember right. Um, so I just kind of split it up and the lines kind of help differentiate between the two to, to separate them. So came out kind of fun. It was a fun project to do. Fun. All right, let's see, Jeffrey. Find the right button. I was uh, working with some of the walnut we got from Theo. Um, you gentlemen remember when he came into the meeting and said, here's my name and address and come out and get walnut. You know, it turns out that tree was huge. The man cut it down. He's 92. Um, I was impressed. Um, I do need to take a minute here to thank Norm for straightening out my photography mess. I thought I'd got it down to the right number of pixels and I wasn't even in the ballpark. Um, but the one on the right and the one in the middle are from that wood. And I was working with what kind of contrast can you get with the grain? Um, the one in the middle got really tricky because that's like a real damn skinny bowl. You can see the, uh, the grain lines. Um, those things start to wobble pretty badly. Um, you can stick a golf ball in the goblet with a little hole in it and put it in your headstock to try to keep it still. And if you crank the headstock a little too tight, you can break those things. And don't ask me how I know. Um, Steve, you remember the off cuts I grabbed from that walnut we cleaned up or, or I helped you cut down at your house? Yep. The one to the left, that's what I was after there is, um, that was an off cut from a piece of walnut and the, the tree had a really sharp arc to it. That, that gave me a real high piece of bark on one side and low on the other. Again, it's it's bold configuration, but I managed to pull it off without snapping it. Um, next up is to try another piece of that and see if I can go multi-axis on that uh, stem without breaking it. And those are finished with five, six coats of spray on lacquer. Yeah. Nice. All right, Terry. Yeah, um, could you go to the next picture first, please? This one or the other? The other, um, the other submission, sorry. Yeah, here. So um, I get a, a lot of satisfaction of using wood from my own, uh, from my own lot if I can reclaim stuff. And this is a piece of uh, ambrosia maple that was spalted. It was the bottom of a trunk about seven or eight inches in diameter. And initially it went in a burn pile um, because the pith was all rotted out. And finally I pulled it out and just uh, turned it into, I don't know, eight or 10 little bowl forms. And so next picture. This, this is one of one of them after I finished it. And I tried to make a, the lip a little thick here and used a knurling tool to put some texture on it. And you can't see it very well in the photo, but there's actually some uh, gold glitter cream in, in the knurling there that you can highlight it in the sun. So it's real small, um, five and a half inches by one and a half inches, but wood from, from my house essentially. So I like it. Is this, is this one of the rough turn pieces in the previous picture? Yeah. Okay. Well, no, it's not. Um, it's one, it's, it's a similar one. Okay. 
Okay, so now you can go back to the other one. And Terry, did you did you put some type of uh, 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 dye or anything on that? Because it darkened up quite a bit, it looks like. Um, yeah, it looks more like big leaf maple from Mike. Yeah, it, it is not. I mean, it came it came from my uh, thing. So I don't know. That may have just been the lighting um, from the picture. Um, but uh, I think it's uh, I think it was I was uh, the antique oil finish there. A couple of coats of antique oil. So it was it was basically the same wood, and it's not big leaf maple. It's just maple from my yard. Okay, thanks. Okay, sorry. Um, so um, then I wanted to try to do something else because making eight or 10 little trinket bowls gets a little boring. So I was trying to figure out what to do with it. So uh, first thing I thought of was a demonstration that Bob had done a couple of years ago um, when we were meeting in person about uh, the no hollow hollow forms and putting two pieces together. Um, so I kind of uh, went through these eight or 10 things and figured out which ones had essentially the same um, finished diameter that I might be able to put together. And my intention was to make a, uh, a hollow form out of it. And about that time, my wife reminded me that she'd like the, uh, the other potpourri bowl that I'd given away to some friends and she needed one. So I decided to... Uh, make a potpourri bowl instead. So I basically joined two of those uh, small uh, forms together um, with mortise and tenon, mortise on one and tenon on the other, kind of like making a lid and uh, ended up making this potpourri bowl out of it. So I used both Bob and Norm's demos to kind of come up with this thing. I was gonna say, you really needed to do a split hollow for him when you had a three inch hole? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just something different. No, I get it. I didn't make perfect wood, sense when you, you explain know? it. Yeah, it, it was just like, okay, I don't, you know, it's boring making all those little bowls. I need to do something else. Plus my wife likes it. So I got brownie points for it. Um, the only thing is, you know, it's easy to conceal the join line, which is the middle one in this one, it's a little harder to conceal the join line on the inside, but I figure when she gets it full of potpourri, who cares? You won't see a join line on the inside anyway. And as long as she's happy with it, it's all good. Nice shape. Very resourceful. No, I, 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 you know, if you hadn't told me, I'd have to really look at it to see it was two two pieces of wood so yeah and in fact the the two pieces that you started out with it you know showed uh first that's the actual two pieces that became um this bowl or this oh. potpourri pot you did a nice job of matching up the green lines at the join thank you i actually did uh purposely you know, do that so that they both uh, they they both matched up as well as I could get them to match up. Um, you know, and I have no idea in the end where they came from. In, you know, in relation to each other in the actual original piece of wood because they just got turned and thrown in a box to dry together. Well, yep. Good match. Thank you. I should done. All right. Is Merle here? He was. Yeah, there he is. Yeah, I'm here. All right. Well, let's... You're on. Okay. Um, this one is a cherry burl um, that I got. I actually got 16 cherry burls last fall. Um, this is bowl number two of that. Um, Steve has got a little idea of what bowl number three is going to look like, um, which reminds me, are you going to be home tomorrow, Steve? I got two more questions for you. Yes. Okay. How early in the morning? Uh, nine. Okay. That's fine. Um, but uh, I got 16 cherry burls. Five of them were relatively small, and uh, 
I'm going to be using those in a, a class that I'm teaching sometime after the summer. Um, but the uh, other 10 were pretty big. Um, I think I'm going to get probably 16 bowls out of the remaining 11. Um, this is just another view of the same bowl. Um, and it really turned out very nice. Um, Sorry, Corey. Like yeah. Are, are you coring these, or do you just uh, you just single? Uh, this this one wasn't cored. Uh, I've got uh, two uh, fifteen to sixteen inch burls that I once I get the outsides done to see what kind of it is on the inside of it. Uh, those two I'm going to try to get. Um, at least four, but I'm shooting for eight bowls out of the center. Um, out of those, the other ones are, are are kind of a little bit punky. So I think I'll, I'm just gonna try to get one. Uh, I'm going to be, next week, I'm gonna be pouring epoxy into one of them. Uh, the, the one that you saw the other last week, Steve. Okay. And, um, in a month, I'll turn that one. All right. That's a, a beautiful figure. I love the color of the cherry barrel. I mean, it's it's just got the, the it, it's just a, a warmth. You should smell my shop. Yeah, I imagine. <laughs> That's nice. That's very nicely done. And this is, what do you say, about 10 inches? How, how, what's the diameter of this one? I think it's about 11 inches and about Four, four, four and a half, five and a half inches tall, I think. So it's four and a half on one side, five and a half on the other. Yes. How did you finish those? Is it like epoxy and high gloss varnish? No, no, that is, that, that finish on there is actually waterlogged. Um, <laughs> All the finishes that I've used in the past and that have had very good luck with uh, have been discontinued. Um, I, I used to use a, a, a Balin Master Gel finish and, and mix it with, um, with uh, tongue oil and Balin discontinued that. And now the tongue oil um, that I was using um, has now been discontinued. So. I'm playing around with a lot of different finishes. Water locks is okay. Um, FYI, for anybody that does use water locks, the formula has changed. Um, and you may have some problems with it on flat work. Uh, but if you do have some problems with it, you can give me a call at the store and I can try to talk you through it. Um, but this one just happens to have water locks on it. Uh, this is this is a bowl of uh, black maple um, that um, I had kind of storing and kind of forgot about behind uh, the in, by the electrical box at Klingspor, and it sat out there for a year. Um, it got bugs and it got spalted, and I just I poured CA glue over where the bugs were. And then it, then it started chipping out. And so I took a pick to it and I ended up putting a lot of turquoise epoxy into it. This went to um, a, a friend of mine who just retired or is about to retire. And uh, so that's her bowl. Is that, that 12 uh, inches, about five inches tall. Is that inlace with the turquoise yep. or is it? Yep, yep, the turquoise. Tur which, by the way, they're getting out of, and it's getting hard to get a hold of. So, if you can find some and you like using it, I happen to like using it. Um, it sets up kind of fast because I usually do just small areas, and I can pretty much get around the, the uh, around the full circle with inlace um, in maybe a day. It's, especially if I start early in the morning and finish, put the last 
put the last little bit on late in the day. So right. it sets up fast. Um, uh, I, I put this in uh, on a, about noon on one day and finish turning it on the next day. I, I also used four or two and a half ounces of thin CA glue on the stuff that would not pick out because uh, this was all full of bugs and uh, sawdust where they were and some of it would not come out and some of it did and so I just coated the red coated the uh, the bug holes or the where the sawdust was where the bugs were with uh, CA glue and this particular bowl took two and a half ounces of thin CA glue. Need need to look at cactus juice Merle. Yeah well <laughs> <laughs> I started picking, and that was the first mistake. That's nice. That's a good save. And besides, I was in a hurry to get it finished. So uh -huh. CA glue was the thing that I had handy. All right. Well, that, and the last two are mine. Um, this is, uh, I, I kind of had a, a month doing other things. So, um, this is a piece that I turned, I don't know, six or seven months ago. It's a, it's a curly maple burl. And uh, um, it's, it is too bad you can't see, see chatoyants in, the, in a photograph, but, but there is some. But uh, it's just a, a simple shallow platter. It's a, about 11 inches by two inches thick. Um, and it's finished with uh, steel cell. Uh, but just uh, I just love the way the burl just kind of almost looks like a crotch in, in the tree, but um, it just uh, just kind of kind of the way it just kind of darted in there was uh, interesting. It does look like it's from a crotch, very yeah. much so. Yeah. The stress uh, lines. Yeah. What? Uh, yeah. How many how many coats of Sela cell do you have on that? One. One coat. But it, it's got seal cell. I mean, when I put it on, I just keep putting it on. I mean, I saturate it and, you know, I just, I put it on, put it on, and then I, I wipe it off and then I stick it back on the lathe with a vacuum chuck after the steel cells dried for a week. And I, um, I, I just, uh, I buff it down with a white scotch bright pad and then just buff it. It's got the, mm. so it's got, um, I, I probably didn't even use the, the buffing compound. It probably, it probably has carnauba on it. And then, but a lot of times I'll do that. And, and I just use a, um, a buffing wheel that doesn't have anything on it. Uh, and uh, uh, Chris Boner taught me um, that, you know, just, just you take seal cell and you just put a, a blank buffing wheel, one of the Beal buffing wheels, mm -hmm. the, the one you would normally use for wax. You just use it as a, as a, and it's just that, Little tiny bit of abrasion in it just uh, just knocks it down. And it gives you that kind of a satin finish on it. Yeah, I've I've done, I've used the same method, but I've I've not had as good a success as you have here with Silo Cell doing that. But uh, maybe I'm not the first coat. Maybe I'm not applying enough to it. So yeah, I mean my my what my de desired effect is to not have anything on the surface. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and the other so, thing, Ted, is you got to let it dry for a week and then some before you try to buff it. Yeah. Yeah, it does take it does take a while, but particularly if you're saturating the piece. I mean, when Chris does it, he actually puts it in a bag um, yeah. when he does his big hollow forms. I don't I don't do that. I just I put it on and uh, particularly on the bowl part of it, I'll just I'll set it. I'll just pour it into the bowl and just just take a piece of paper towel and um and you know just 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 keep rubbing it around top and bottom and mm -hmm. uh and, and and probably do that for 20 minutes um and then and then just wipe off everything on the surface just like so it's it's dry and then just let it go and that allows you to not have that build on the surface hmm. yeah i i've tried it we're saturating i put it in a a, a plat you know saturate it and put it in a plastic bag so it can't evaporate, you know, so it's soaking in. 
and pull it out in 20 minutes and do it again, you know, kind of thing, and then pull it out 20 minutes later and wipe it all down. But I don't end up with enough. There's n never seems like there's enough on it, you know, to get a good finish out of it. Mm. Uh, typically, I'll, I'll wait till I have three or four pieces and I'll, I'll just put them all on the bench and I'll just I'll just go from one, do one, you know, all four top front uh -huh. and back. Okay. go back and do all four again front and back and I, and I'll do that for again 20 minutes to a half an hour till it, till it stops taking it and it typically the end grains taken more so um, mm -hmm. but that that's that's just that's what I is and it doesn't always work but this one this one just uh just I was just taken by the grain on this yeah it's a I really think, nice finish on there I think this piece of wood came from Mike Smith's uh, junk pile Chris used to have a barrel or a big container and he would basically submerge the piece. Yep. Uh, the yep. problem with a bag is that once it drips off the top, it's no longer soaking in at the top. Yeah, yeah I think Chris said uh, he, he would buy the stuff five gallon in five gallon pails. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't, I'm not I'm not that committed, but um, yeah, it's a that's a, it's a and then the last piece for the evening is just uh, I, I made a um, I had a commission piece at Christmas. I, somebody asked me to make a paper mill, a pepper mill uh, uh, with the fractal burning on it. And I made one uh, for them. And the person who received the gift uh, contacted me and asked if I could make a corresponding one so they could do salt and pepper. So this is uh, fortunately I had. The, the rest of the piece of wood that I made the first one out of. And it's just, it's, it's just a piece of hard maple. Um, and it's just fractal burn. And you'll see there's a little walnut plug on the top that I put in there so you can tell the difference between the two. Yes. So, and that's a, it's about 12 inches tall. And that's, I, I tend to just make that in the pepper, salt and pepper mills that I make. I just, um, I use the crush grind. So you don't have a knob coming through the top and, um, and I tend to just make that shape. I find it's it's easy to hold and it's easy to replicate. So have you, what's have you tr tried the fractal burning on mahogany yet? Uh, I've done it on sapili, which is similar. I don't, um, nice effect or no? Um, yeah, you have to be. Um, I can't remember. I, I mean, it's it's. It, it, it's so porous that um, it. The, Smoky. Yeah, it, it it the electrolyte dries so fast that um, I, I I have to I can't remember, but I I, I have tried it on Sapili and um, it it didn't work that great. It works better with the tight grain woods. I've got a big pile of of uh, mahogany. If you want a piece or two to play with, just yell. All right. Even this looks so yellow, and the other one looks so yellow too. Is that the light, or is that truly the maple? Um, it uh, well, the other one was kind of yellow. I mean, it's just kind of the the picture. The um, the the maple when you use the um, the baking soda solution on it, it does tend to tint it a little bit. Yeah, and looking at it now, it it does. I. I I have to play with the white balance. I, I probably have to play with the white balance on my camera. I just got a, I just switched to a new bulb in my softbox, and uh, I probably need to change uh, play with the light balance, uh, white it looks balance. Like it's a the warm light. Or the floor of this image is fairly yellow, so it must be the light. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. But um, Cell will yellow. Tongue oil has a yellowing effect for sure. Yep. Yeah, I'll to, that, that's a, I'll, I'll have to play. I, it, this is probably a white balance problem with, with this new bulb. I switched from, um, just so uh, that John Vase suggested, I switched from using a flash in the softbox to a 300 watt or the 300 watt equivalent uh, LED bulb uh, just mounted in my softbox. So, um, but, uh, and that's the first, these are the first two pictures I've used with it. So. All right. Wrap it up. Yeah. There. Yeah. There you go. Go. Oh.
See that backdrop? This took two days to put this up. Here we go. This is a professional action. In 1955, yeah. I brought a plastic model tugboat for $3.49. This is the dispatch number nine. It's a harbor tug made for the U.S. Navy in 1945 in Tampa, Florida. When I got it about half done, my dad said, wouldn't it be nice if we made a five-foot model off of that? We can learn, you can learn how to scale. And uh, he was a very good woodworker, too. So we made a five-foot model of this plastic tugboat. It took 30 years to do it. <laughs> It has radio control, it has 12 volt lights. These are, LED, these are not LEDs, these are light bulbs. All these lights work. There's uh, batteries in the front. It has a two cylinder steam engine. Top comes off. The cabin comes off here. I can show the cabin on the inside. The engine and the boiler are mounted on a tray so that you put water in here, sterno in the uh, tray down below, and you get everything fired up and cooking, and you put it in, in the end in the boat. Here's the engine on the back end, the pressure gauge, sterno tray. The hull is laid up of sheathing boards. These are laminated together. The deck is tongue and groove maple decking. Uh, the whole thing is shaped. These are cut out with a saber saw, hand saber saw. We didn't even have a band saw. It's uh, shaped with a draw knife, good sharp draw knife. Radio control, the servos under here, that rod runs the rudder. Radio controls under here, batteries would sit in here. We'll go over the engine next. You see the winch and, and all the davits and little things, those were all turned uh, and uh, you wouldn't believe what we had for a lathe. We only had three tools in those days and nobody knew how to sharpen anything. But anyway, I'll show the engine next. A radio controlled steam engine. I love it. <laughs> this is the power plant for the dispatch number nine tugboat. It's a two cylinder steam engine, a boiler, Steam engine is three quarter inch bore, three quarter inch stroke, double acting. Crankshaft's 90 degrees so that it starts no matter what position you're in. This engine was made by hand. We had no metal lathe. We didn't even have a drill press. The milling machine was a piece of plate glass with emery cloth on it, and we rubbed the castings back and forth. The castings were from Stuart Company in England. It's all hand drilled. The only thing I messed up twice was the crankshaft. I had to have the crankshaft made, but everything else was handmade. The boiler has a pressure gauge or pressure relief on the top. This is a blow off valve, pressure gauge. There's a funnel. You screw this funnel in, you pour water in here, it takes about a quart and a half of water. Once that's in, you put this back in here, and you take the sterno tray out. This is about a quarter of an inch deep, and you fill this with sterno. Sterno burns by surface area, so when it's when it's full right to the top, this is really hot. This whole thing is burning. When the water's cold, that brings this up to steam. By the time it comes up to steam, this cuts back to about an inch and a quarter and goes down here, and that burns for another like 45 minutes. Runs about 30 pounds pressure. Boiler has fire tubes in it. The heat's in the bottom. So the heat is down here, comes up to a baffle, goes across the baffle, goes up and goes through the top. It's a three-pass boiler. It's 
so the heat goes across the boiler three times. The engine has a little coupling on here that fits onto the shaft that goes to the screw. Once you get everything cooking and the pressure's up, you turn this on and the engine starts running. I'll run the engine on compressed air. This is about four pounds pressure because there's no load on the engine, but it'll run fast at first until it normalizes. That's about where it runs. And it chugs along pretty good. There's no reverse because there's no reversing lever. It's a real job to make a steam engine reverse. Anyway, <laughs> thank you for watching. That's that is so really cool, cool, Jim. Yeah, yeah. But even, yeah, some the, even some of the cast iron was turned, but uh, we didn't have a lathe that it, it was pathetic what we used. But anyway, do you want to see it again? The engine ring. <laughs> the question, Jim. So once you start that engine going, uh, it, it just keeps going, right? There's no starting and stopping it. Yeah, there's a valve on here. I can start, not radio control. It could be, if you stop it with the radio control, then you got to get rid of the steam somehow. Yeah, yeah. So, so once you put it in the water and you start it going, you just keep it going until it comes back to you again. Yeah, yeah. And that's the next video. Huh? Is that the next video? Is what? Oh. I want to see if that's the next video with it in the water. No, not yet. Well, well it, it has been. It many has been times. many times. Yeah, it has been. But uh, it's a two man job to do it. And uh, a lot of fun. And I get burned. Like I said, I get burned every time I do it. But you can tell it's not machine made. The thing is uh, fairly crude. And machinists say, oh, the head bolts aren't spaced right. Well, that was done with a drill motor when I was. 20 years old or something. Uh, they're pretty close. Anyway, the flywheel was turned on a, on a wood lathe. Um, a lot of things were turned on a wood lathe with scrapers and files and whatever else. This is before I knew how to sharpen a tool, but uh, I, I can show that. That's about where it runs. It's kind of a thrill to see a steam engine run under low. And it chugs along pretty good. There's no reverse because there's no reversing lever. It's a real job to make a steam engine reverse. Um, Rita was the director in uh, this is take number uh, 6,827. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. And where's the, uh, I want to know, Jim, where the steam whistle is. Yeah. <laughs> I thought about that. You tell me that too. Anyway. Um, <laughs> it can't boiler. be done, but uh, it, there's tough. a lot of design between getting the amount of heat to the amount of water to the right amount of steam so that that engine keeps going at the right speed. So that tray with sterno in it, I made this thing at first with a, a, a boiler, just a round uh, can with a I think charcoal underneath it and that wouldn't work. So I fired it with wood and that didn't work. I tried some other things and I even made a, a burns matic torch St stands on end with a manifold under it and and that didn't work really good and finally I got the sterno and that darn stuff's hot boy I'll tell you and and I put fire tubes in the boiler I can't show you the boiler but the whole the whole thing was all this is all designed um I'm just disappointed it doesn't run on wood shavings yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> no, it won't. It runs for a few seconds, but to get the amount of steam to the, that size engine continually is uh, not easy. Well, that 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 T-shaped uh, sterno tray that that's really ingenious to to get that the uh, larger surface area and then to get the water up to pressure the steam up to pressure and then and then to throttle it back just reduce surface area reduce surface area that's a uh, that's that that really is ingenious, Jim. <laughs> I never would have thought that's of that. Same. Oh, that yeah. is wonderful engineering to figure that out. Well, you you can't uh, you can't be there to throttle things back, so it's got to do it. I, I made a couple of those before I got it right. Believe me. Yeah. Well, thank hey. you very much, Jim. That was uh, thank you for sharing. That was very entertaining. And uh, for those of you still on, we will uh, we'll see you at our membership need, meeting next month. Uh, thanks, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, gentlemen. Bye.